Hi, I'm Emma Miller and welcome to the full version of Art This Week Bio's Conduit Gallery. Here we present the full interview we filmed with Robert Barsamian about his experience with Nancy Whitenack and his history with Deep Ellum. Robert moved to Dallas in the mid-1980s from New York and has shown with Conduit Gallery since 1984. We spoke with Robert to give a perspective of what the 80s were like in Deep Ellum and what it has been like to work with Nancy over the past 30 years. Now for our interview with Robert. It was something else that drove me. Actually, it was having the support and the understanding of a dealer that would allow you to do whatever you wanted to do. And Nancy was that type of person. Because I made a major uh, vertical change. I went from painting to doing installations in 1990, when it was just beginning. And she, we were riding on some pretty good success for sales and my work and stuff. And we were coming down from a, um, <clears throat> lawyer's office in downtown Dallas where they had asked me to do a commission painting for their conference room. We came down and on the escalator leaving and I said to Nancy, I just turned to her and I said, Nancy, I can't do this anymore. She said, what? I said, I just can't paint these things. It's like being in a factory. I said, I've, I've painted them out. I can't do it anymore. I have to do something else. I know, I remember it. She went, <coughs> you know, one of those things like, ah! my wife also did that. But <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'm interested in this new genre of, you know, installation. I think it's something more I'd be interested in because it has a lot of ability to draw many different disciplines in. And I'm really interested in that. So she said, OK. So I put a proposal together and she was the first one to allow me to do it. And she was way ahead of herself. I mean, people around here were really traditional. If you were a painter, you did paintings. If you did prints, you did prints. But you never varied from that. You know, and uh, pretty much like in New York, New York was the same thing. They classify you immediately. If you come up with something different, sorry, we can't sell it. Goodbye. That's literally what happened to me. It was that when Nancy allowed me to go ahead and do these installations, the other galleries that were representing me in the East Coast all just said goodbye. We can't sell that stuff. And I said, well, you know what? It's not just all about selling. It's about the creating a, an aesthetic language between you and a form of communicating between you and those who are viewing it. And if you don't have that, what are you going to have to carry you through the rest of your life? Nothing. Just to keep making product. I said, my dad, fabulous jazz musician, his mama shut him off at an early age because she didn't think it was a proper thing for him to do. And he worked in a factory. My dad worked in a factory for like 50 years. I said, what's the difference between myself making the same image over and over again and my dad working in a factory doing the same thing over and over again? Nothing, it's exactly the same thing. So I said, I, I can't do that. And I was willing to give that lucrative income to be able to experiment with my work. And that's been my philosophy. And like I said, one of the things that's really important is to have somebody behind you that allows you the venue. Because then you have a goal to shoot for, as well as an, uh, an aesthetic desire. Uh, so you moved from New York to Dallas. Yes. Why did you move and how did that change your art? Well. You know, I spent close to, at that time, 18 years in, Dallas, in New York, excuse me. And the problem was that although I had some gallery representation, the majority of my time was trying to exist there. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to make art. And I got really tired of constantly working, doing other things. I worked in the museums. I worked as a, an electrician, an alarm installer, so many different jobs that I wasn't concentrating enough in my work. The best send-off was that I had just had a show at the, uh, the Bronx Museum, my first big museum show. It went real well. So I was feeling pretty good about myself, but I still needed to get out. And I de decided with my wife that it was time for me to travel, although she had just gotten a job she loved, so I said, you know what? 
you can stay here in New York. I'll go back and forth to no matter where it is because I don't want to take you away from your opportunity. So that was the decision we came to. And I came to Dallas because I had a friend who was here who offered me a part-time job. So I said, okay. And he had some other connections because he used to be a CEO of a bank in Texas at the time. So he said, you know, we'll help you find a place. Well, because of the recognition level I was having from the Bronx show, uh, some people were willing to take a, a risk. And I ended up in probably one of the most unique situations. Yes, I had this opportunity to move into the Crescent. And they allowed me to live there, up in this mansard roof. And I had this fabulous studio that looked out over uh, on clear days. You could see, the, almost you could see out to Fort Worth. It was amazing. Of course, this is back in 84. So at that time, there wasn't all that buildup that's there now. So I, I was really fortunate and very lucky. Uh, the most interesting part was how I connected to Nancy, and that was very interesting because I first came down with my wife in 84 because my friend was getting married, and I had not been to Dallas before, and my wife said, why don't you bring some of your stuff down, see if anybody's interested, and I said, oh, okay, I'm not really good that way in selling my goods, so I said, okay, and I remember going down Elm Street and I saw Nancy's space and I thought, hmm, this is really nice. I walked in and looked around and walked back out and I didn't take my stuff in with me. And I remember she, there was a parking lot next to her building, which was located next to a photography studio. And I sat on this little railing there with my wife and I kept saying, I don't know, should I go in there? Shouldn't I go in there? She's saying, why don't you just go in? I'm saying, I, yeah, 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 I, I don't know if I can do this. So I said, okay, what have I got to lose? I'm leaving and going back to New York anyway, so it doesn't matter. So I walked in and I showed my stuff to Nancy and she says, yeah, I'd like to show your work. And I said, okay, she says, I'd like to tr take a trial first. I'm having a group show coming up. I'd like to put your stuff in the group show. So she had a couple of paintings and again, to my blessings, I, the both pieces sold. And so after that, it was just a, a development of our relationship and my work. Um, we got to a point where uh, that momentous day came when I had told her that I was going to change, that this no longer was going to be the face of my work, and that I was going to start working on these installations. And not only were they installations, but they were politically oriented, dealing with subject matter, that is about the Armenian Genocide, which is my background as an Armenian, therefore an unresolved history event, which might cause problems. And she said, that's okay, do it. Let me see what it is. So I remember in 1990, we had the very first show, the first installation. Uh, I, because of my uh, relationship with a lot of people in the political Armenian field, a lot of people came from different parts of the country, New York and stuff like that. A good friend of mine, Peter Berlakian, who's an author uh, and a political activist. Um, the, the local Orthodox priest came, a whole bunch of people came, people from the Armenian Benevolent General uh, uh, Association came, and they made an event out of it. It got on TV and all this stuff. And to me, all I was interested in was opening this new brand of work, this new style of expression. The very first day, the day op the, the, the show opens, there's a Turkish guy out there uh, uh, picketing the show and handing out flyers. It was so interesting. I said I knew this kind of stuff was going to happen because of the un unresolved issue. And so that kind of followed me for a long time. But Nancy was still willing to handle the work. Uh, and it's followed me forever, ever since then, for the 20 years I was deeply involved in, in that expression. Um, but without her foresight and without her understanding and her willingness to be willing to take a chance with the artist and with the aesthetic the artist has, it would have never happened. And I think that's one of the things about Nancy that I respect the most is she believes in the people she works with, not so much how much the product sells. Can you talk about what Deep Ellum was like, um, what Dallas was like in 1984? You know, I used to live in Soho 
back in 1970, when Soho was not really well known, I was maybe one of two dozen people that lived down there. Uh, it wasn't unusual to bump into Andy Warhol or Grace Jones or Dolph Lundgren and people like that. And the only thing that was around was the Spring Street Bar, uh, a few, OK, Harris Gallery, 100 Acres Gallery. Just there weren't that much. And I went there for the reason that I believed that this was an environment that would be conducive for creative expression because it was very earthy. There were still things about it that allowed you to be organic in what you wanted to do. And there was an accessibility at the time to different things. That changed over the years. And I think that happened because in 1970, there was still this belief that it wasn't about how valuable the work was monetarily, but how valuable it was in expression. As soon as that monetary aspect took over, things changed immediately. Um, so at that time, um, I had representation by two galleries, and they, things were doing pretty well. And I was teaching. So, you know, it was really nice. And those were the days when you could get, my loft was 2,500 square feet, and I was only paying $500 a month. Now, <laughs> that's impossible to think of these days, but that's what it was like. And um, it was a whole completely different scene. So when I had decided to leave New York, I wanted to find some place that still had that bare roots beginning sense to it. I went to L.A. with my wife. We thought, nah, we don't want to live here. So my friend invited me down to Dallas. And, he's, and uh, we came down. We looked at things. We went down to Deep Elm, and we both, our eyes were wide open. I, and we said, boy, this could give us an opportunity. So, you know, we shopped around. We worked with different real estate people. Finally, we found a guy whose brother was in the arts. And he said, I have, I'm representing a few buildings down there. Would you be interested in looking? We went, short, long story short, we rented it with the consent of the owner to renovate. But we had to be secretive about it because the city wouldn't allow that to happen. Uh, because they'd have to rezone the whole area. And, you know, those types of things do not happen overnight. And so we decided to go ahead and do it. And we found a very nice environment there. And plus, as Nancy was explaining to you earlier, there was a community there that was already beginning to develop. It had a real strong sense of the way Soho used to be. And then my later experience in the East Village uh, in New York, that um, East Side, I should say, uh, that made me feel as though this would be the place to work. We could start from here. So that was the main reason why we went ahead and rented a space down there and f quickly became friends with a lot of people and very close friends with Nancy and David and Barbara and Jordan. and. Uh, a very funny story. I'll tell you a little, little side story here if you have room for it. I used to hate what they did to the environment. They used to put up posters all over the place. And they, they made these, and I know there are people saying, I ah, just a fuddy-duddy. But, you know, you get up on a week, uh, on a Sunday, uh, a Sunday or a Monday, and you'd find beer bottles everywhere. You'd find, it was a mess. So I took it upon myself. I got a big old trash can with wheels on it, and I went up and down Elm Street and cleaned the posters off, threw the trash away and everything. And much to the chagrin of a lot of the uh, club owners at the time, uh, I found out from the city that there's an ordinance that says you'll get fined if you put it on the, on the poles. So I send them all letters telling them that <laughs> they were not happy with me at all. And I started a crime watch down there and started working with the police department. And uh, finally, somebody coined that I was the mayor of Deep Ellum. And I used to go up and down the street and collect garbage and stuff. <laughs> and I'm not saying that it was popular with everybody, but you know, it was my thing at the time. So what has Conduit meant to you over the years? Well, Condo to me has meant home. 
and it's a base. And again, that sense of security comes from the fact that Nancy's willing to support what I do as a person. That doesn't happen in a lot of galleries. A lot of galleries, you either become part of a main stable or you become uh, what they call, you know, uh, their, their turnover, where they make a lot of money and then they support a main stable. But uh, Nancy's completely different. You know, I mean, there were pretty, probably plenty of opportunities for Nancy to tell me, well, I don't know if I want to carry your work anymore because you're not generating any capital. <laughs> you know, you might get a lot of news coverage, but you're not making any money. <laughs> you know, but she doesn't, you know, that doesn't count. For her, it was to give me the stability at least every 18 months to show. And I've done that since 1984. And I'm skipped to beat with her, you know, and it's, and it's always a pleasure to know that that one outlet is there for me. Not that if it wasn't there that I wouldn't do the work. It's just that it's just an opportunity for me then to communicate with people. Because if unless I get response, and not from the written word, and not from uh, some critic or historian, unless I get response from people, the people who are viewing, I don't, have any, I don't know that I'm doing anything. I need to have the input from people, whether it's negative or positive, I don't really care long as they respond to the work, because then I know I'm reaching them. Because to elicit any of those responses means you're communicating. And in that case, you know, it's always been the opportunity for me. And it's always great because, and the one thing I always admire about Conduit and Nancy is, again, she, is, she sees things into the future, much like my wife in her business, and she's willing to take a chance, like move down here to the design district. Well, you know what, there's a lot of people who have moved down to the design district because they saw that Nancy was able to maintain. Because when she first came down here, there was not many. But now if you walk around, there's quite a few. So, and this, you know, the same kind of initiative that she had when she moved into Deep Ellum. And for me, one of the things, again, that was very important about Nancy and Conduit is that Nancy came from an inspiration that came from within, and she did what she did based on that inspiration. Not on an art education, not on a degree, but because she had a desire to be involved with these things. And that, my, I believe that kind of passion drives you more than anything else. We want to thank Robert for speaking with us. You can find more information on Conduit at ConduitGallery.com. Watch for other episodes about Conduit Gallery over the next few weeks. Also, look for a link below in the show notes for the full interview with Robert. That's it for Art This Week Bios. Thanks for watching. Still got your polaroid